Thanks. Rachel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just a, two or three points. I mean, I think information management and control of information is just one of the biggest issues of our time in all sorts of ways. I mean, Nora's already referred to the, uh, the Snowden, Snowden affair, I think she called it. But I think there is a really problematic perception that data in itself has some intrinsic value mm -hmm. rather than how it's analyzed and used. And I really wonder sometimes what percentage of data or information collected by humanitarian organizations is actually necessary, useful, how much is collected in an ethical way and sort of managed and then ultimately destroyed uh, in, in the way it should be. I think specialist agencies um, that work particularly on sexual violence and GBV have very good systems. I think the generalist agencies are the ones that we need to watch, and I, I speak as for coming from sort of that camp. Um, one of the big challenges, I think, for humanitarian organizations is that sexual violence isn't just about incidents. So I think also Jenny talked about policies and practices. Um, but also not just about incidents that have been reported, because we know the vast majority are not reported, but it's also about root causes, attitudes and beliefs, secondary victimization, all sorts of things. So we do need a much, a much broader um, approach about working together in a more collective way, specialist agencies and generalist agencies. And this is in a context where I think if you look at the major donors, and I'm sorry, it does sound like I'm banging this drum about donors, um, but if you look at the major donors, there's more and more push for more organizations to work on things like GBV. We've got gender markers, we've got a sort of ECHO, DFID, sort of major donors really looking at humanitarian organizations having more of a push around GBV, um, at the same time as around results-based approaches. And I think you combine those two things, and that could be actually quite a dangerous thing. You could have a lot of people <coughs> who should not be going around asking people really, really sensitive things about sexual violence. And that's something that we should, we should really... I mean, there is one of the standards, I think, in the information management chapter, which is about, uh, and I paraphrase, because I'm not quite, quite sure if I can open it at the right page, but it, you know, nobody should collect data where they don't have the right systems, protocols, uh, et cetera, in place to do so properly. And I think that's a really important message from an Oxfam one point of view. We don't need to ever ask someone, have they been raped? We're not gonna offer them a service. We're not gonna do anything that will immediately help them. And we don't need to ask them. And I think we need to be really careful to, on that issue in particular, to get it right about who does collect information and all the difficulties around information and, and what it means and how it's interpreted. Mm. In a nutshell, it's uh, necessity and capacity, the, what, just, uh, what uh, Rachel just mentioned, the, the two basic principles of the data collection. Necessity and capacity. Mm. Jenny, did you want to add anything else? Um, I think Guillaume and Rachel covered it perfectly. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask Francesca, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before I ask Nora for her closing um, comments? Um, perhaps I'm going to be very, very, um, very, very brief um, because Nora started her presentation organizing the, the points, the remark that she, sh that she shared with us using the three C's of, I wrote it down. Um, she had commitment, confusion, and competencies that these are three areas uh, uh, where we should uh, focus our, um, where we can, that we can use to focus <laughs> our, our conversation. When it comes to evaluation, perhaps, there is an insider joke among evaluators, and we know evaluators are not always the most hilarious and jolly bunch, <laughs> but they say, <laughs> they say, well... You, you said it, we didn't. <laughs> exactly, I can say it. They have the problem of ABC. The ABC is the problem that evaluators have, is the mother of all problem in evaluation, that is attribution, bias, and causality. So these are going to be the headache you have to confront <laughs> when you are embarking on, um, on evaluation, and even more so when it is evaluation of protection, for a number of reasons that both and that all the speakers at the table actually mention, including when it comes to data collection and using the information, deciding what is relevant to collect by whom and how. This is the, this is the point that speaks to what uh, 
uh, Rachel was just mentioning. Do we have a system that captures the information that is really required for us to conduct uh, monitoring and evaluation work? And also, do we have a, an m and &E system? Do we have any strategic document that speaks to when it is necessary and advisable to go for an external evaluation, this is something Willen was, was mentioning before, as opposed to some sort of internal learning activity or inter internal review. Evaluation is not for all seasons. Impact and outcome evaluation are not for all seasons. There are different exercises you may want to conduct, and sometimes you want to emphasize an internal learning-oriented exercise, and sometimes you want to go for an external evaluation. But always be careful, what is the data availability? Um, what is the uh, principled and culturally sensitive and context-aware approach that you want to have in the evaluation team that is going to go around and ask those information. So yes, we are going to, as a takeaway, to have the three C's and perhaps the ABCs. <laughs> Thank lots you. Of, lots of letters to remember. Thanks, Francesca. Nora, I'm just going to ask you for any final comments that you'd like to make uh, on your, your session. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, very brief final oh, okay, comments well, so that we can open the floor for discussion. OK, I think that's important. And I had been asked to speak to the issue of sovereignty, which kind of fell off my agenda because of the time constraints. So maybe as a closing comment and looking to the future, um, I guess there's three things I want to say about sovereignty because it, it is a, it's actually it's more the sovereignty narrative. But looking at this before coming to London, the earliest reference I could get to the definition of sovereignty as uh, involving responsibility was Pez de Coya back in 1989. I know it's often attributed to Kofi Annan at the end of the 90s, but it seemed as the Cold War was coming to an end, and most probably the Secretary General wasn't the first person to talk about this. But that was the earliest reference I got to it, and of course we know that in the mid-2000s and 2005, we got the responsibility to protect. So I think when speaking about sovereignty, it, uh, we're moving, whether we're in the north or the south or the east or the west, a better appreciation that it is not just some kind of ultimate power, that it does involve responsibilities. Uh, the second point I wanted to say on this is that 9-11, the global war on terror, that of course continues to be played out, has really also shaped the debate and discussion on sovereignty. And we've seen now that um, a term I've tried not to use in my working life or otherwise is this T word terrorist because it seems it's very easy to brand someone with such a title and that that somehow then allows for all kinds of uh, repressive mechanisms whether it's the young people who were agitating and I'm always going to get this wrong Taksim Square as opposed to Tahrir Square but also in Tahrir Square how this label is used to justify all kinds of mayhem and whether this is in by the Rajapaksi regime in Sri Lanka or I said in many other settings and then the last thing I want to say about globalization and sovereignty going forward as a challenge to the humanitarian system is that um, as globalization intensifies, I think uh, I definitely don't have a strong enough picture on it to comment on it with authority, but we do know that the role of the nation state is changing. It is being transformed from inside and without, and uh, those of us living in Europe definitely are conscious of the limited ability of individual countries to push back against, for example, the recession, and also how, for example, it is impacting on the middle class and their traditional leverage. So all I want to say on this is that uh, moving forward, the global order and a rule-based order is being challenged as, as we sit around this table, and we've seen that every day in recent times, and that that will have an impact on, th on the role of the nation state, and it's, uh, I think, a challenge to the humanitarian system to face up to the changing global order. It is not just a shift from the west to the east, but also internally and beyond, and that the nation state, as I understand it, will be is rightly seen increasingly as the one actor in a system of global governance and that a big part of that global governance, this is the last thing I'm going to say, is our unaccountable systems, whether we're talking about the banking system, the corporate media, or more recently, intelligence agencies. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nora. Well, thanks to all of our panelists for uh, participating in, in that round of uh, questions and to Nora for her presentation. I'm go going to open up the floor now for questions and comments. I see Sarah's already got her hand up from both the people in the room as well as the online audience. I've got one uh, question up here already from John Cosgrave, which I'll read out uh, shortly. 
Um, but I'll take, so I think I'll take three or four. If you uh, could identify yourself and your affiliation if you have one, <laughs> and also if you want <laughs> the question to be directed at a particular <coughs> panelist or panelists. Right, so Sarah Collinson. <laughs> thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for your excellent presentations and, and the points that you raised. Two that I'd like to pick up on particularly, um, one from Nora and, uh, and then uh, a point made by Jenny very forcefully. Nora, you said that organisations, particularly looking at the Sri Lankan context, organisations have become too big for protection. My question is whether they're too stupid for protection. That they're nice but dim, to use a, an expression. Um, and the reason I say that is that one of the reasons that there was such a, uh, a protection disaster in Sri Lanka was that the humanitarian agencies were so comprehensively outmaneuvered by a very clever government. And I think that where the human rights organizations perhaps had an edge was that, that, that many of them did have a perhaps a more um, fine-tuned grasp of the political situation and the complexities that they're engaging in perhaps and that was my experience at least my own anecdotal experience of talking to some of the people at the time and in meetings subsequently and um, and so that underlines an, um, the point that Jenny made about context analysis being so important but we've been saying this for years and um, and one wonders why nothing really improves when push comes to shove in some of the most difficult situations. Um, but obviously without that understanding, then none of the other things follow. You can't monitor what you're doing, you can't identify threats effectively, you can't work out who's threatened in what ways and so on. Um, and I'm encouraged with the new standards, but I think it's number 11, I've just had time to flick through them, but I remember the last ones, I think that the, the analysis side was somewhat left to a bit of a footnote under staff training or something like that and my impression just at sort of first gl glance is that it, it's definitely been given higher profile in, in the new standards and I think that's very encouraging. Um, I'll leave it at that. But I think it's, it's apt that it's um, under the SMART objectives. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Sarah. Uh, we've got a question here in the front row. Hi, Lauren Cooney. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Lauren Cooney from MSF. Um, yeah, I guess I direct my question partly to Nora and, and Guillaume, and it's linked to, to what Nora said um, about the commitment and energy to challenge inhumanity as well, um, and, and linked to Sri Lanka in this case, but I, I've seen it in other places as well. Um, and, and having been very involved in Sri Lanka in my, in my previous role with MSF, with our emergency desk, and, and definitely present during those last days and uh, having... Um, quite some uh, debates uh, myself with myself and and our very senior emergency team that w that were there um, and I, I guess it comes to the question of the role that uh, uh, operational humanitarian organizations such as MSF that certainly have we have a very strong advocacy mandate within our charter but uh, not specifically protection, I would say. We don't have a, a, a protection advisor similar to Oxfam. It, it's not, we, we talk about it, but I guess it's not what's in our objectives and, uh, and our, our core activity, and it, although there's a, a lot of overlap. Um, and, and the role of um, other organisations in that um, and, and how to balance that role against your operationality. And I think it's uh, linked a bit uh, to what you were saying. Um, it, the challenge, if you take Sri Lanka, of being faced with that being extremely limited anyway by by a government and and a very real feeling um, uh, of having to balance is 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 it better that we should be at uh, Omantai and treating wounded people as they come out, or is it better that we should be saying something about this situation? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and how to balance that role uh, uh, with your operationality when, you're, when your core role is perhaps not protection but it is in fact very key and core to, to what you do and what you see. Thank you. I've got an online question here which I mentioned earlier but I'm going to read it out now. So as I said before, this is from John Cosgrave who's an independent consultant and he's one of the co-authors of the ALNAP, ALNAP pilot guide on the evaluation of humanitarian action which is being piloted now. Is that right, Francesca? Okay, and, and John's asking, to what extent do the 59 standards and guides in the ICRC document 
provide a framework for evaluating protection interventions? So that's quite a broad question, but I think I will direct that maybe to Guillaume initially and uh, anyone else who wants to, to comment. Um, and then one more question, if, if there is one we could take in this round or comment. Simon, can we have the microphone please? Thanks. As, as Wendy said, my name is Simon Harrigan. I, I was one of the contributors to uh, HPN 72, which was a, a report on local to global protection. And um, I looked at this, uh, the question that we were asking here and, and thought to myself immediately, uh, monitoring the protection that we give or monitoring the protection that people are asking for? And this was the question that we came up with in, in, uh, in, in our study was that there was a a dissonance between the protection that people wanted and the protection that we gave. Um, in the studies, we we uh, we had a study in South Kordofan, uh, in Sudan. We had a study in Jungli in Sudan, and two studies in Burma, uh, one on uh, Cyclone Nargis and another in the refugee camps, and the final one in Zimbabwe. And in all of those five cases, and it seems as Nora says for Sri Lanka. Uh, protection uh, by the international community failed uh, and failed to protect what the, the, the lo local people because what local people were essentially asking for was physical prote protection from insecurity. Sorry, Simon, can you hold the microphone down a little bit lower, I think, actually? Yeah, yeah thanks. What people were asking for was uh, physical protection from insecurity and that's not what uh, agencies were giving. So I would say if you're monitoring protection that we give, it's perfectly possible to monitor it. If we're, if we're trying to monitor the protection that people are asking for, then you are asking the impossible, because what they're asking uh, is things that we are actually incapable of doing, and because we're not simply present in every single context, every village, every uh, place where raids uh, or insecurity happens. And our problem is, if we're not present in those contexts, what we often do is we end up uh, concentrating on the, uh, not on the physical protection side, uh, but uh, what Rachel referred to as the self-protection responses, which could be negative. And those are the bits which we can address. We need to contextualize that those are not the only protection threats that people suffer from. And sometimes the protection threats to their insecurity are far more abusive uh, than the things that we actually work on. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that's uh, enough to be getting on with for right now. So I am Sarah's uh, comment about our, our organization's, um, well, nice but dim. Uh, you know, that they were comprehensively outmaneuvered in Sri Lanka. What's your view on that, Nora? Um, thanks, Sarah. I Trying to scrunch things down to sound bites isn't very helpful, but that's what I have been doing. And I actually think it is. It was a question: or Have organisations become too big for protection? It's provocative, but it was a question that was posed to me in different ways when I was in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'll come back a little bit again to the um, commitment part of that. But basically, um, you know, what I found in Sri Lanka, and I'm specific about Sri Lanka, is that, and it's not unique, unfortunately, but. The, we know that, and I'll come back into what also Simon said, these are complicated situations and it's really important to bite into it and to make appropriate decisions I and mean, when you haven't to, to revisit that. But quite often what I find is that things are scrunched down to kind of silly, uh, I can't say equilibriums, I don't know what the term to use is here, but you get all the time, is it access or advocacy? Is it presence or principles? Is it being pragmatic or is it being protective? And then a new one I've picked up more recently, denouncing and delivering. And I think these are valid ways to perhaps summarize some situations. But what I am arguing for, based on my experience, is that it's not either or, it is how we go about it. And that uh, I think, unfortunately, my conclusion in Sri Lanka is that there was a huge problem with commitment. And I mean, I, I still grieves me, and I won't talk about it too much because I, you know, I might even start crying again. But speaking to victims, survivors, our own staff, we don't even actually know how many were harmed and how many were killed. Now, what I think that tells us an awful lot. Um, 
and the focus was on the war was over, and that definitely needed a focus. But I think we were, I don't want to keep going back into my C words, but I think questions can be asked, and I'm not the person to answer them. Were we too complacent, and were we complicit? I think Sri Lanka really should oblige all of us to rethink what is the essence of being humanitarian, what is the quality of our humanitarianism. Um, Lauren, MSF, uh, I'd mentioned earlier that a few agencies did go back and reflect, and rightly so, and one of them was MSF, also NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council, and the World Food Program, and there are probably others, but in my short uh, research, I. I did talk quite a bit to MSF colleagues, so I know it is difficult, and I think hopefully some of the answers I tried to, feedback I've given to Sarah, because they're not answers, would also answer some of your questions. Of course, there was absolutely a need for medical care, no two ways about it, but I think what it, that to me points out then is that you do, you do with your MSF or whoever, you need to be part of a system, because of course not one individual or one individual agency can do everything or be everywhere. So I think it really points to the need for a relief system, a humanitarian system that works and that is strategic. And then I think it is possible to move further than we are. Um, I won't answer John's question on monitoring and evaluation because others are more competent. But Simon, I hear what you're saying, but I probably will take some issue with it. That of course humanitarians, whether you or me or somebody else, cannot physically provide physical security, but we can push on it. And there's evidence to show that uh, when we as a humanitarian system challenges in humanity and can do so with, in a robust fashion and are committed to it and are strategic about it, we can have positive outcomes. And that's what I'm, I think that's what a number of us are calling for is that of course we cannot physically stand in front of uh, indiscriminate warfare, but we can challenge it and change it. And that's what Afghanistan showed us. I said it was a difficult environment because um, all of the donors, with the exception of Switzerland, and perhaps India, if I can include India in that, were belligerents. And uh, that makes it much more common. But it was possible to bring attention to it. And of course, you know, where I agree with you, the role of the local community, the role of those who were directly <laughs> affected was super important in that. But the other thing I will say about this, because there isn't enough time to cover everything, is that we're all part and parcel of impacting on the situation that undermines the safety and protection that people have a right to when we are instrumentalized and uh, when we allow that to happen. And there is ways also of avoiding being instrumentalized. I think that was another grievous error, if that's the way to put it, of the humanitarian system in Sri Lanka. I, I think they actually knew what was happening. They were quite aware, Sarah, of the dynamics of the situation. And we all knew that the donors and others, member states, had a give war a chance agenda. We actually knew this. And we knew why it was never going to get to the Security Council. And just like there was that consensus in Sri Lanka, we now know that there is par paralysis. There is no consensus on Syria. And we know that's the problem. So uh, what I'm arguing for is that we face up to this. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Guillaume, did you want to address any of the questions, but in particular the question from John about the standards? Um, yes, with pleasure. The, on the standard, it's, it's, a, it's actually quite a good question because, yeah, obviously we have, there is one small chapter, a bit longer than in the, the or oh, it's now a chapter, there were only a few standards in the previous edition regarding monitoring and evaluation of protection activities. But in the end, the, the, the standards, the whole, the whole document itself, can and should probably be used to monitor not uh, protection activities on the field necessarily, but more the, the protection endeavor of, um, of protection agencies. Just as an example, we used in, in ICRC, we used a few months ago the, the chapter six of the previous edition, which is now chapter seven, uh, called the professional capacity, ensuring professional capacity. So we used it to, to, eva to the, the internal audit of the ICRC used it to make an evaluation of whether uh, we have we are we are up to these standards to check if really we have uh, the um, sufficient training competence uh, tools and all that to deliver properly protection activities and as you may expect they found some they had some interesting conclusions quite a few elements where uh, some improvement would be necessary and we are working on it uh, right now we are also using the the, 
what is now chapter six of the new edition uh, on uh, data management, also to question our own practices in data management, as Rachel mentioned. Uh, data management in protection is, uh, is quite uh, complex. Uh, we are dealing with very sensitive information. We should not probably always be dealing with so much information, but with, when we do, we have to uh, manage it properly. And here also, we are trying to work and, um, and improve uh, the, the way we, um, we, uh, we manage information. So without any doubt, uh, these documents can be used and should be used proactively by protection actors to question their own practices and seek to identify uh, areas where uh, progress can be done. Francesca, did you have anything to add on, on any of that? Um, no. No? Okay. And uh, Jenny and Rachel, um, do you have any comments to make in response to those questions? Um, I'm wondering particularly about Simon's question and maybe how the focus on outcomes might be used to address that about doing protection. Jenny, do you have any, uh, anything sure. to... Sure, yeah. Mm. Uh, unless Rachel's ready to go ahead. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, Simon, I, I, I know your study and it's been, uh, um, it's been very useful for us in Oxfam in looking at your work. Um, I think it, what's interesting is why there's that disparity between the protection we can give and the protection people are asking for. I mean, I think on the big extreme level, it, it, it's obvious. As Nora said, you can't physically protect people. We're never going to do that. We never pretend that we're, we're going to do that. I think people actually tend to, in interacting with humanitarian organizations, tend to be quite realistic. They don't expect someone like me to physically protect them in the face of shellfire or whatever. They, they, but they would like the international system. They would like someone outside to be doing that. And I think um, that's where this sort of collective strategy uh, around protection that seems to be lacking in so many cases is so important because it links into um, the leverage that we do have to start looking at advocacy, diplomacy, political action, and that the way that we can try to contribute and to make sure people get the physical protection they need or that they, they, you know, the perpetrators uh, desist from, from what they are doing. So I think that's, that's a role that we can play. Um, and there, there, there will be that disparity if you look at it in the big picture, but we're only part of it and we need to think collectively about what we can do and how we can work the system so that it does offer more physical protection. Thank you, Rachel. Jenny, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I actually, um, I mean, the, Simon, I'm sorry to say that, that the framing of the question itself I find to be part of our problem um, in that we have been more and more using uh, the term protection as a verb, um, as something that is done to somebody else. Um, we speak of protection as something provided. Um, we say we are, you know, in a certain place to protect people. Um, and this is, I think, a, a fundamental problem with the framing of who is responsible for what. Um, NGOs cannot protect people. They, can, they, they don't have the power, the authority, or the legal responsibility to ensure that a population is treated in the manner that, um, that it is meant to be. Um, in the context of armed conflict. The only actors that have that obligation and responsibility are the parties to conflict. And, you know, if we frame protection as something that in fact is our obligation or responsibility or something that we have the power to give or provide, um, then I think not only are we misinforming the population that we intend to assist, we're we're missing the point about what it is we should be doing to bring about greater protection, to bring about protection as the outcome. Um, and, I, 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 you know, you look at a context like Syria or Sri Lanka, and of course, you know, the immediate question is, well, what hope is there to convince uh, the parties to conflict in Syria or in Sri Lanka to change their behavior in the heat of hostilities where they are responsible for such grotesque mistreatments of, of people. 
Um, but I think it goes back a bit to, well, why are, why are we, why do we constantly look at protection as a last minute intervention? Where is our longer term investment in the norms and building up a, you know, a, a, a body of expectation um, that could help to preempt such scenarios in the first place? And this goes back a little bit to Nora's emphasis on the framing, um, you know, the fact that in the context of Sri Lanka, certainly a number of um, member states of the UN spoke in terms of giving war a chance. You know, it was the context of the war on terror, and you know, who would dare to challenge the Rajapaksa regime that, you know, terrorism, you know, absolutely should be defeated and and what have you. And it, it you know, if we if we think more in terms of what investments need to be undertaken to not only respect but ensure respect. Um, for for civilian populations, then perhaps our framing of it will give rise to a, a broader set of possibilities and, and menu of options to uh, avoid the scenarios whereby people are, are subject to such intense violence. Um, I think the other thing is, in the heat of hostilities like this, uh, you know, we shouldn't be creating the impression that we have the capacity or, or the ability to quote unquote provide physical protection, but we absolutely should be in dialogue with the parties to conflict and negotiating with them um, about um, alternative scenarios, for example, for the evacuation of a civilian population, what have you. So in the context of the Vani, for example, where people were trapped in a so-called no-fire zone, um, you know, how robust actually were negotiations um, to facilitate evacuation of the population? Or what, what, what sort of dialogue had been undertaken in the preceding months or years such that at, having reached a moment like that, um, we would have had greater leverage vis-a-vis -vis the parties to conflict to facilitate um, their, their evacuation. So um, I, I think we, we, we need to challenge ourselves about the fundamental framing and not allow ourselves to descend in, into the sound bites uh, about how, how we describe protection, which limits our thinking. Thanks, Jenny. Um, let's uh, move on to more questions. Oh, yes, we've got someone here at the back. And I've also got one online, which I'll read out in a minute. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Chizom Eke, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Peace Brigades International. Um, and basically, Peace Brigades International is an organization that provides accompaniment protection on the ground to human rights defenders in uh, conflict situations. Um, so kind of following on from that, and they work in you know, different conflict zones around the world um, and you know, very particular sorts of conflict zones. So they work in Colombia, they work in Indonesia, they work in Honduras, in Mexico, in Guatemala, um, and they've recently opened um, a team in Kenya. Um, yeah, so my question is actually about, uh, it goes back to the point about, you know, whether kind of big organizations have now just become too big to protect. Because actually, smaller organizations like Peace Brigades International and other kind of more grassroots organizations like Frontline Defenders, like Protection International, like Nonviolent Peace Force, uh, these are organizations that actually kind of manage to somehow cut through the bureaucracy, cut through the complications surrounding all the logistics, and they understand that their mission is about providing immediate protection to those that need it. Um, and they send volunteers into the field that are willing to do that. Uh, and this is backed up by, uh, you know, organizing uh, meetings with military officials, reminding, reminding them of what their duties are under international humanitarian law, you know, working with the government, working with other agencies in the field. Um, and so I was just wondering what efforts have been made for, you know, big humanitarian organizations uh, to actually kind of look at those organizations and seek to work with them uh, and to see if there's anything that they can learn from them because as well those sorts of organizations also welcome uh, that kind of support um, and also as well I mean I know that there is as you said at the beginning a distinction between humanitarianism and actually human rights 
but for the human rights community, there's no way that you can talk about protection without talking about impunity. And actually, impunity is what fuels conflicts. So, you know, if, if people are having their rights violated, but there is no access to justice, and the perpetrators know that there is no access to justice, then there is no restraint in terms of the actions and the abuses that they commit. So I would like to know, you know, what role do you think there is actually for international human rights frameworks and international, uh, kind of the International Criminal Court, for example, in kind of working with you to, uh, to, to promote protection of civilian populations um, in conflict. And then in just in terms of data management, um, yes, we can document the incidences, but actually human rights defenders have asked that the perpetrators also be documented, that there needs to be naming and shaming, because again, this goes back to the issue of impunity. And then the other point is actually about new forms of warfare that are happening and the role of humanitarian organizations in uh, kind of dealing with these situations. So, for example, new Sorry, weapons. Sorry, uh, can I ask uh, that you, that yeah, you sure, finish up? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, this is my last point. Uh, yeah. So it's just about drone warfare and, uh, and the way this is now being used as a new form um, of, of war and violating human rights. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry to cut you off. It's just that we want to make sure everyone has, uh, has enough time. Uh, let me read out the one on screen here. Uh, this question is from Ian Levine, who's the program director at Human Rights Watch. Um, and I think this was communicated via Twitter. Um, he asks, do human rights and humanitarian actors speak the same language regarding the monitoring, of the, monitoring the impact of protection? And if not, what to do? So that's from Ian Levine. And I think we have another couple of questions here. It's Josh over here. The microphone is here. Thanks. Hi, uh, Josh Rasplin from Red Eye. Um, I wanted to ask a question on, um, which so Rachel uh, brought up on uh, monitoring protection and uh, specifically on gender-based violence and how the protection infrastructure is very much geared towards um, the female uh, protection mechanisms. And uh, there's been uh, many studies recently, um, both uh, highlighted by The Guardian, I know MSF has released a report or, or done news on this as well, and how um, this is progressing forward as it's becoming a theme that's uh, increasingly needs to be incorporated in the uh, monitoring, um, sorry, the protection infrastructure. So I was wondering if um, anybody had a point on that, uh, or anybody could address how this is being fed into the monitoring and evaluation side, et cetera. You mean the increasing focus on gender-based violence? Yeah, to, okay. to, uh, specifically because the, the infrastructure is mainly geared towards uh, um, one gender and uh, the male population, although it's a s it's a smaller minority, it's there are issues with um, uh, monitoring this and mm -hmm. also it feeds back into the cycle. Okay, fine, thank you, um, uh, Sandrine. You had your hand up first, and then Francis. Yeah. Hi, um, Sandrine from MSF UK. Um, Thanks. It's really it's been very interesting to hear all of you. I'm I'm interested actually just to get some uh, views from from you about uh, integrated missions and situations. I mean, Nora mentioned you know the Afghanistan uh, situation where you've got belligerents who usually would be taking on protection roles. So in I mean in the case for example of Monusco in DRC, which has a department within it that is monitoring and reporting on uh, protection issues and human rights violations. And whether that actually is a sort of watering down or whitewashing of their own responsibility or, or is it actually improving their performance? Because I think you can see different examples, says she diplomatically. Okay, <laughs> thank you. 
And then uh, Francis. Um, Francis Stevenson from Help Age International. Um, I, I want to take a kind of um, what, what will probably appear to be quite an unfashionable viewpoint in this, in this forum. Um, we, um, in, in, in relation to Nora's point about confusion, we talk, you, you talked a bit about definition and um, um, sort of the, the comparing aid, um, physical provision of aid to protection as an activity. Um, and we're all familiar, I think, with this, this really chilling term of the well-fed dead, you know, the people who've got lots of food but they're dead because they weren't protected. Um, I think people, people also die because they don't get food <laughs> or medical care. Um, and I think that, I mean, for me, I, I think that actually is the bigger protection challenge for us, for, for the for humanitarian actors at the moment, because we're seeing more and more, and this has actually been, well, the argument has been made much better by ICRC and MSF than I, than I can make it here, but just to, just to reiterate it, is in places in the heart of conflict in the world today, in Syria, in Somalia, places like that, um, the problem is not a lack of protection advisors, it's a lack of food and medical care uh, and things that are going to keep people alive um, and it doesn't and, and and the fact that lots of people are advocating on their behalf to not to, to no effect actually I was going to say not much effect to no effect I'll say um, is is neither here or the, here nor there and it's just as well that there are some people a few people in there who are able to provide food and uh, medical care and the basic things that are going to keep people alive I think we just need to be a bit more um, proud of what we do as, as humanitarians in actually providing aid and a bit more realistic about what we can achieve with advocacy in terms of protection. I think we should not stop doing one in order to do the other and that is the trend in the humanitarian system these days I think. It's a very worrying trend and we have to stop it I think. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for in terms of questions and comments. So I'm going to refer back to the panel and I'm not going to um, ask you to address every question, but if you would just like to pick out uh, the ones that you feel you want to address. And I'll start with uh, Guillaume, I think, on the end here. One interesting way, if I got it well, the question from Human Rights Watch was about whether human rights and uh, humanitarian actors speak the same language in terms of protection. Yeah, yeah uh, regarding the monitoring of the impact of protection. I, well, I, I hope so because that's what of what is the interesting element of this uh, of this work, and not not just the, the standards, but it's the it's a process that goes almost uh, uh, twenty years back in history. But we've been working on that with together humanitarian and human rights actors. So we, um, as far as we understand, human rights actors who participated in this process. Uh, shared the same language so it would be it's a work in progress so there is no doubt it's not a final document set in stone it's still something that we are going to continue discussing to adjust to develop to precise and so if there are some uh, some um, other other views it will be certainly interesting to to get them but for the moment the impression we had was that yes we do speak the same language okay thank you um, yes Sorry. Francesca um, Perhaps uh, just, uh, just a point to complement on this. Um, I would say that concretely, uh, one way of uh, exploring this a little bit further, what I would argue, is to see whether the two communities are putting emphasis uh, on, different, on different elements of their um, theory of change, if you will, when they are uh, designing protection strategy, when they are looking at protection programming. Um, so the first question I would I would um, I would uh, ask back is whether um, there is a theory of change that is made explicit in both evaluation research or um, uh, strategy settings uh, when it comes to, to protect protection programming. And perhaps we see that the building blocks are the same, perhaps, but the arrows and the emphasis mm -hmm. and the sequencing may, may well be different because the understanding, the mindset or the bias that we bring uh, um, in, 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 our, in our job in the, different in the two communities perhaps is, is different, perhaps not, but there would be mm -hmm. one way of testing this. Yes, good point. Um, thank you, Francesca. Rachel, do you want to, I, I was wondering if you could, I am going to be directive now, and ask maybe if you could, uh, if you think you're able to address the question from the, the lady from Peace, Brigade, Peace Brigades International, as you talked about the, uh, the need to, to work with a, a wide range of actors in, in some contexts. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm familiar with peace brigades and we've worked alongside um, peace brigades in um, Colombia. And I think, yeah, we've got all, in terms of an overall protection strategy, then if we do look at the bigger picture and how lots of different organizations work together, then that should be as each using our specific skills and, and, and strengths to complement each other's work. Because one thing's for sure, in terms of trying to reach a protection outcome, no one organization or entity or authority can do it. It's really got to be a collective action. Um, there were a lot of questions in there down to drones and so on. Mm. That I, I, I that we probably haven't got time to go into, and I have to say it's really not something that I, I know about particularly. I think the, the issue about tackling impunity, I'm not sure if I would say impunity is the only thing that, that drives conflict, but it's clearly a, a, a huge problem and in terms of the number of countries that fall back into conflict because of unresolved um, issues from, from the conflict, particularly re relating to impunity. I think it is a crucial issue for the humanitarian community and for the international community. Mm. And, and what about Josh's question about uh, the protection infrastructure? And yes, um, actually it's really timely because last week I was in uh, Kenya where Oxfam had hosted a, a round table on gender and conflict, but it focused on the impact of war on men and gender relations and looked at men and masculinities in conflict and had people like, you may be familiar with uh, Chris Dolan from the Refugee Law Project, who's done an awful lot of work on sexual violence targeting men and boys, uh, Heal Africa, who run a, a hospital in, in Goma. I mean, a lot of the thinking around the way men and boys are affected by sexual violence and other forms of, of, of um, GBV has come out of the Great Lakes region. There's, there's some really interesting information, but you can find it if you look at reports from Sri Lanka, from Sudan, all over the place. The MSF has done some interesting uh, reports that have included looking at um, uh, sexual violence against men and boys. So I, within Oxfam, we, within our protection work, we certainly we have a very inclusive approach to gender. We want to look at how men and women, girls and boys, are affected, and how gender relations are affected by the way people are targeted and the differential impacts. And we do, uh, within the protection work, we look at the definition of gender-based violence and we do include um, violence that's targeted at men and boys because they are men and boys um, in our thinking from a protection point of view. I know not everybody in the humanitarian community, certainly not in the GBV community, would agree with that, but I think there is generally a trend to acknowledge that much more. And I have program examples and notes from that round table and all sorts of things I could share with you and anyone else who's, who's interested. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, Jenny, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to comment on any of the, the questions. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on a couple of things. Um, maybe first uh, regarding human, human rights and, and humanitarians, uh, responding to Ian. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not so worried about whether or not we speak the same language. Um, we'll always probably have some differences in, in terms of concepts and language, but um, for more or less, I think it's, we're on the same page and I'm less worried about that. I think our, our challenge more is to look at what are the specific you know, outcomes that we wish to see in a given context. Um, and I, I guess I, I see room for humanitarian and human rights organizations to collaborate more um, on the contextual risk analysis um, and look for ways to enhance their complementarity, even if we're coming at it with some different angles, different specializations and what have you, I, I think there is room to come to a better common sense of what overall desired outcome we are both aiming for. And I, I think the professional standards are probably the only tool now that, that really allows us um, to, to explore how we go about that. Um, and there, there will always be cases whereby, you know, we may disagree um, at the emphasis that human rights organizations place on the legal process, you know, the, the timing of pursuits of indictments or invoking, you know, international mechanisms. 
But at least if we are informed by a common analysis and we speak with one another frequently enough, um, we can synchronize our efforts uh, much better and, and be mutually informed. Um, regarding integrated missions, um, Sandrine's question, um, I, I think it's less about integrated missions, and I, although that is hugely problematic in my view, um, in terms of our potential as humanitarians to positively impact on protection. I think the, the case that, that you outlined in relation to MONUSCO is more about a protection of civilians' mandate gone wild. Um, you know, the degree to which I, I, I think that uh, peacekeeping operations have exploited this idea um, that they have a positive role to play in terms of protection of civilians and framing, you know, their intervention and their action in a very partisan manner um, under a protection of civilians label has become hugely problematic. Um, and it's really important for us to closely monitor that and speak clearly and early um, about what the specific problems are um, in order to avoid a scenario where, um, you know, it is simply a whitewash um, and Panusco and other forces are, are not held to account. Um, the last thing I just wanted to pick up on is the, the, the question of the dichotomy versus um, assistance versus protection. And I'm not quite sure I heard the, the question clearly. Um, but I, I think if, if, we, if our fundamental purpose is to help ensure that people survive um, and are treated properly in situations of armed conflict, it doesn't matter whether it's assistance or some other action that's being taken. It's what is it that needs to happen um, in a given situation to, to, to save lives and, and preserve human um, dignity um, in those situations? And, and what is our role to help bring that about? And that can take multiple forms. Some of that action will involve material goods. Some of it will not. Um, and I don't think we need to become um, too concerned about this, uh, this dichotomy. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's about how civilians are meant to be treated. Thanks, Jenny. Now, I, I know Rachel has to catch a train, and so if she slides out the door before we, we finish, uh, we'll, we'll understand that. So I'm sorry that we're running uh, slightly over time. But I'm going to hand over to Nora now to respond to questions, and then we're going to close the session. Thanks, Wendy, and actually thanks everybody, including, I should have said this earlier, for lots of very useful, very interesting, helpful questions, I think really contributed to the debate and the dialogue. And I can be also relatively brief because other panelists have answered, I think, or addressed some of the questions. And my only way of operating at this point is to go through them one by one. So a colleague from Peace Brigade, um, I think other colleagues have commented, of course impunity has to be addressed, whether that is the task in the here and now for humanitarians and how they would do that is a big discussion because humanitarians tend not to be involved directly in the here and now in judicial processes. But obviously it, it, it is a huge issue. But I also, I mean, I agree with you that there is a lot to learn from smaller organizations who perhaps are more nimble, more flexible, more committed, Mara, dare I say that, and uh, clearly a lot to learn from each other. But Ian, I don't, he's probably not online, and I don't know if I fully understood his question, and I don't want to get into semantics, but um, my own experience is, do we speak the same language? I think what is important, and Jenny and others have, have already spoken to this, is that um, we're operating in, in the same legal frameworks, but do we, on a day-to-day -day basis, speak different language? Most probably. I know I definitely did in Afghanistan. I headed up a human rights team, but the work we did on civilian casualties, we didn't talk about violations, and if we had to determine legally whether a violation had occurred, it would take us forever. We did focus on patterns of harm, and we were able to reduce the incidence of warfare that was harmful um, over a period of time. So I think it is important to know what it is we're aiming for, and. I think what Sri Lanka shows is, is that uh, we, are, we have not yet learned how to be complementary to each other, which is a, where I think uh, we need to give some more attention to. Um, I think Jenny has said a lot of what I was, had made notes as I was going along here, that uh, in situations of crisis, and this also I think addresses a little bit of what Sandrine posed to the floor and also Francis, but in situations of crisis, you know, as I understand it, uh, when lives are at imminent risk. The task of humanitarians 
and it is also a task in a different context of others, the approach of others would be different, is to help save lives. And that uh, we're focused on trying to change facts on the ground. And as I said earlier, um, you know, it's not that we're going to stand in, in, in front of a drone attack or indiscriminate firing, but what we're trying to do quite often is change the narrative, change attitudes, change behavior. And there's lots of examples where that actually works, and I think is worth investing in more. Um, I was going to talk about the need for partnerships and talking about human rights and humanitarians, but perhaps I won't go there because of time factors. Sandrine's questions on integrated missions, I'm not adequately familiar with MONOSCO. I know a little bit about it, and Jenny spoke to it. You know, having worked inside an integrated mission, and people challenged me before I did that, and they said, Nora, why are you going over to the dark side? And my answer was, well, I'm going in with my eyes wide open. And, you know, heading up a, a big <laughs> program on human rights and humanitarian um, protection issues, the way we dealt with it was to try to insulate uh, issues that were very politicized, very contentious from that um, political debate and from those political tendencies. So for me, it was super important to insulate the work that was done on civilian casualties. And of course, it wasn't just what Human Rights UNAMA did, because a lot of the work was done, and I should have said this earlier, by those directly inf in involved. I mean, we are now have the advantage of all these what I call accidental activists people picking up a phone, documenting an airstrike, an IED event, and sharing that with, with uh, people who were, who were in a position to bring a stronger spotlight to it. So for me, what was important in the UNAMA context was to insulate that work and to be impartial. I think these two things were pretty significant in not being um, sidelined by the, I think, actually so-called integrated missions, because for me, integration is this. I can't do this for people not watching in. But in other words, I think quite often both the humanitarian and the human rights agendas are subordinated to a political agenda that is at odds both with human rights objectives and with humanitarian objectives. And then perhaps the last, oh, Francis, um, is it either or? Well, I think, you know, I've already commented on this. I definitely don't think it's either or. And as Jenny pointed out, if our task is to help save lives, then we do have to look at all the threats that put lives at risk, I think point number one. And I think point number two, and I've got mentioned it a few times, and can I make a plug for the Golden Fleece? There's a book out there on instrumentalization, mm -hmm. because I think the danger of not being adequately sensitive to protection issues and problems that ar arise under a protection umbrella, which is not necessarily the case, is that we're in danger of becoming party to processes that are in themselves harmful. So the way we go about, for example, distributing food in Liberia just as the war was ending was enhancing or was strengthening, I shouldn't use that word, was strengthening the role of, of guys with guns to do harm to those who are hungry. So I would say it's super, super important that we do operate with a, pro with a strong protection lens and that the issue indeed is not material or non-material assistance, but both are needed in all crisis situations of extremity. Thanks. Thanks, Nora. Well, I wanted to thank everyone for coming today. Um, a video recording of today's session will be posted on the ODI website within a few days. Um, I did want to point out before you leave that HPG will also be exploring over the next couple of years the opportunities and challenges for protection work in relation to the use of new technologies and approaches, you know, some of the drones being one of them. But looking at uh, two key research questions around how innovative approaches such as remote management and the use of technology change the way protection actors work, and if so, how? And have these approaches altered the levels of protection being provided to local populations, and if so, how? And does a lack of proximity actually hamper the ability of protection actors to identify protection threats and address violations with alleged perpetrators in a meaningful way. So watch this space because we'll be looking at some of these issues. I want to thank the ICRC for uh, their leadership role in producing these standards and to both the ICRC and HPG for hosting this event today. So thank you very much to all of those of you here and who were watching online. Thank you. Thank you.